Attributes are the simplest and fastest way to modify how our code is interacted with in the Unity editor. Frequent use of attributes can significantly decrease the risk of developers making mistakes while working on the game, and they also make our components look and feel so much better. In this video, we'll look at using pre-made Unity specific attributes. First, we'll very quickly go through what they are, and then we'll walk through various examples to learn how to use them for ourselves. As is the case with all videos in this series, if you already feel confident on this topic, do feel free to skip ahead. Otherwise, let's get started. Attributes are part of the c -sharp programming language. We can think of them as modifiers for how parts of our code is interacted with. For our purposes, it means that we can change how specific fields and classes behave in the Unity editor. Here I have a new Unity project. I'll begin by making an empty game object and a new script to put onto it. I'll simply call it example and get it opened in Visual Studio. So let's say that I in here want to have a public string and I'll just call it description. Just like that and I'll save and head back into Unity. So of course here I'll get a little field where I can write a short sentence. This works perfectly fine unless you want to write a longer sentence or a full text. Because as you'll see, once I reach the edge, it just starts scrolling to the side and that's not very convenient because I can't see what I wrote back here and I can't really see, like if I move the cursor back here, I don't really know where in the sentence I am and I also cannot add new lines. In these cases, it would be quite a lot better if it behaved more like a text editor. Luckily for us, there's an attribute called text area, which achieves exactly that. So let's get into Visual Studio and see how to use it. When we want to use an attribute, we go before the piece of code that we want to modify and we open square brackets. In here, we just write the name and you can see that it suggests us here and describes it as an attribute to make a string be edited with a height flexible and scrollable text area. That sounds pretty cool if you ask me, so I'll write that, save and head back into Unity. Okay, as you'll see, the text area has now jumped down to be under the name here. This means that it's a lot wider. Also, it is taller, and you'll see that once I reach the end here, the text will simply wrap down around so I actually can see all of it at once. I'm also able to click enter to create new lines, and I get this nice little scrollable area over here that I can scroll up and down. But perhaps this is still not good enough for you. Maybe you want to write a really beefy text and you want to be able to see much more at once. Well, as fortune would have it, attributes are a bit similar to methods in the sense that they can take arguments and have overloads. So if I open parentheses here, we'll be able to see that there are two overloads and the second one allows us to specify a minimum and maximum amount of lines. I'll just try writing 10 and then 20 in here and I'll save and go back into Unity and we'll now see that the text area has gotten 10 lines tall already. And if I fill them out and write more, it will simply expand until we hit the 20. And at this point, we'll get this scrolling area again. This is quite the improvement from what we had before. And it was all achieved with just this little line. This shows you something about how simple and powerful it can be to use attributes. Something else I want to point out is that attributes are made to be used in a specific context. Text area, for example, only works with strings. If I were to change this to an integer and go back in here, we would see it complaining in both the console and in the inspector here. For now, you just need to know that this doesn't work, so don't do it. Okay, now I want to show you the two attributes that I by far use the most. They are called serialized field and hidden inspector. When programming, it is good practice to hide as much information from the outside world as possible. If you're, for example, making a character controller script and you want to have a variable for the movement speed, you might be tempted to make it public just so that you can mess with it in the inspector. But this brings in a lot of problems because making it public makes it, well, public to all other scripts and it means that they can modify it. Later in development, this could lead to some really weird behavior as your movement speed might start changing around without you really knowing why that happens. That then in turn leads to some wasted time debugging and all in all, it would have been better to just leave it as be on private. The solution to this problem is to use a serialized field. So let me show you this. I'll make a private integer and call it private var and public int public var. Okay, so when I go into Unity, we'll of course be able to see the public variable and not the private variable. However, if I now go in here and add serialize field and save, we will be able to see both of them. Ta -da! So this neatly solves that problem. Now, hidden inspector practically works the other way around. So where serialize field makes private variables show up in the inspector, 
inside an inspector hides public variables from the inspector. So as you can see here, now we can only see the private variable. This is quite useful if we have public variables that only are relevant at runtime. That is, it isn't something that we should mess around with out of game. Another thing I want to point out is that serialized field only works on types that already are supported by the inspector. That is, something that would work when it's public can now be made to work when it's private. But for example, a property, even though it's public, will not work in the inspector. As you'll see here, it doesn't show up. Even if I go in and write serialized field, it will not change anything. So the same is the case when using interfaces and stuff like that. Serialized field cannot make something show up that wouldn't otherwise show up. Now, I use serialized fields so often that I like putting it on the same line as the code itself to save some space. This is just completely down to preference and you can do it however you want. Now I want to show you the range attribute. So let's imagine that we have a public integer called degrees and we want this to show some information about the rotation of an object. There's no point in this number going below zero or above 359 because then the same number could just be represented with a number within that range. So to enforce this, we can use the range attribute. We can write a minimum and a maximum number for the variable below. So if I, for example, here write zero and 359 and save and go back in here, we will see the variable appear on this little slider. So I can drag it from zero and all the way up to 359, but not beyond. If I try to edit this number to something higher and click enter, it will simply just jump back down. This is also a good opportunity to show you that these attributes only actually affect how the inspector deals with them. If I were to go in here and in the start method, write that degrees should be 400 and then head in here and click play, you'll see that it actually jumps up to 400. It goes completely off the slider. That is because the attribute only limits what you can do in the inspector. It does not limit what the variable actually is. Now, if I try to change this to 401, for example, it will jump back down, but it does not limit what I can do with script. If you want to limit the variable itself, you should use properties. Okay, let's move on to a different kind of attributes, some that are related to the layout. So let's imagine that I'm making a bit more complicated script, like a character controller. Here I want to have a lot of different variables, for example, a reference to the rigid body, or B, maybe a reference to the collider, layer collider. Let's say I want to have some floats here for maximum speed, acceleration, let's also do a jump height, and a gravity. Okay, so there's nothing inherently wrong in this. If we go into Unity, we'll of course be able to see all of them and it works completely fine. However, if we have a lot of variables like this, it can start to look a bit messy and clumped up and it can be difficult to find exactly what it is you need. This is where it can be great to start using these layout attributes. For example, we might say that these two are fundamentally different from these two and you're only really going to need these when setting up the game objects. Whereas these four are something that you need to tweak all the time. So we could split them up and we do that with the header attribute. So I'll write header here and this allows us to write a title. So I'll call this setup and down here I'll make another one called movement. And just for clarity, I'll also put a little space in here. So in going into Unity, we will now see these titles in bold and a little spacing in between. So they're clearly separated and it becomes a lot easier to find the things that you need. We might also determine that while these four are all part of the movement, they're a bit different because these two deal with movement speed and these two here deal with jumping. So we could represent that by adding a space in here. So we'll see that that just adds a little spacing in here as we might expect. The third attribute I want to show you in this context isn't that much about layout, but it's kind of in the same spirit. Let's say that we have a designer working on the game here and they think, well, the movement is a bit weird and I want to tweak the values a little bit. And he goes in here and starts playing around and then he sees gravity. What the hell does gravity mean? At this point, he could open the code and hope that you've written some comment in here, but that takes time and is bothersome. What you can do instead to make his job a lot easier and faster is to write a tooltip. So as you see, we can open here and make a string. Gravity is the acceleration applied to the character. So if I save this and go into Unity, I'll be able to see this message when I just hover over gravity here. 
This can save you from so many misunderstandings. And especially if you're making something like an API, you definitely need to have things like this. Okay, enough about variable attributes. Let me show you a couple that are used on classes. Let's say that we here in this character movement script don't want to have to assign the rigid body manually. We're a bit lazy, so we'll just make this private and then make an awake method here and say that rigid body equals get components rigid body, just like that. So at the start of the game, it will be assigned. This will work completely fine if we remember to actually add a rigid body to the game object. If we haven't, we'll get an error and we'll see, okay, it's complaining about that. We'll go in, add the rigid body, and now it's working. But that is some time wasted, and we don't like wasting time. So what we can do is go up here and write require components. And you can see that it describes it as the require component attribute automatically adds required components as dependencies. I'll show you what that means. If we open parentheses here and write type of, and then the kind of component that we want, so rigid body, and then save and head into Unity, it will now require that there is a rigid body on this game object. It won't update immediately here because this component was already on, but if we remove it and now add it again, it will add the rigid body too. And if I try to remove the rigid body, it will give me an error here. Can't remove rigid body because example depends on it. So that is what was meant with dependencies. Now this ensures that we won't get errors from this. And as such, we save ourselves some time, which is always great. Okay, now for another example for the last attribute of the day. Let us imagine that we want to have a recipe. So a recipe needs some ingredients. So I'll make a class here, which I'll call ingredients. And an ingredient probably has a name and maybe an amount. Let's say we here want to have a single ingredient. So I write public ingredients ingredients. Now we might expect that this will show up in Unity and that we'll be able to modify it. But when we go in here and take a look, we'll see that it actually doesn't. Why is that? It is because ingredient is not actually supported by the inspector. It cannot be serialized. To fix this, we need to apply the serializable attribute. It lies in the systems namespace because it's not actually only for Unity. It has much wider capabilities than just making it show up in the inspector, but we won't deal with that for now. So using system, and then we can write serializable. And that is actually all we need to do. It will now show up here perfectly like expected, and we can write things. That was all I wanted to show you this time. There are many more attributes to use, but these are the ones that I myself use the most. And the purpose of this video was to introduce you to the concept, not to make an exhaustive list. I encourage you, however, to go take a look at the other ones. I'll leave a link in the description to their page in the Unity manual. In the next video, we'll learn how to make our own custom attributes to achieve things that we otherwise couldn't. If you find yourself running into a problem multiple times over your game development career, it can be a great idea to make a custom attribute for it, as you'll be able to just copy it into future projects and use it there too. If there's another particular subject you want to see covered in this series, you can write it in the comments. You can also head over to our Discord server and suggest it there. It's also a nice place to hang out and check out our games if you're into that kind of thing. I look forward to seeing you there. Until then, have a magnificent day.